first, I want to say that I am a pastor in the ABC USA. Um, I have been a pastor in the ABC USA for um, 15 years at my, almost 15 years at my current church and uh, a total of 18 and a half years. So I was youth pastor at uh, First Baptist Church of Centralia uh, and then uh, Warder Street Baptist Church in Marion, Illinois. And now I'm the pastor of First Baptist Church of Mount Vernon, um, Great Rivers region. I've been in Great Rivers region my entire uh, ministry career. So if Paul's on the line, hey, Paul, Paul's our executive minister, so I don't see him. But if I do, I'll say hi to Paul. Um, so let's get right to it. So here's how the book came about. It all started with a tweet. This is the tweet. Um, when I sent it out, uh, just over two years ago in March of 2019, um, I start the book by telling the story of just, I got this new data from the general social survey and I, and I wanted to just see what had happened to American religion between 2016 and 2018. So I've made this graph while my kids were taking a bath before they were going to go to bed. And, um, between getting them dried off, I had the graph done. I wrote a couple words. I used big news at the top. I hit send on the tweet. And um, then I, you know, got my kids ready for bed, read them a book. And all of a sudden I looked down at my phone and I had seven or eight retweets. And then two hours later, I had about 75 retweets. And then the next morning I woke up and I had a couple hundred retweets. And the thing basically went viral from that point. Um, it got retweeted um, almost 1,200 times. And it landed in the laps of some of the biggest media outlets in America. I was on the front page of CNN uh, at one point. Uh, this is the New York Post, the Washington Post, uh, the New York Times, both reprinted the graph that I made using the same data. Um, I made the front page of Reddit, which is this ag news aggregating website. I got 71,000 upvotes. Um, I was getting calls and pings from all people all over the world asking me questions, wanting to know more about the nuns. And I thought, well, if I'm going to write a book, why not write a book about something people care about? Because obviously I've kind of struck a nerve here. So, you know, let's not try to make people interested in something. Let's already, you know, something they're already interested in and getting them more interested in it. So that's, that's where the book came from. It sort of raised my profile in the media and people started calling. People started emailing, asking questions. I thought, I need to put all this information in one spot. Fortress comes along and asks me if I have any book ideas. And so that's where The Nuns was born. This is um, American religion from 1972 to 2018 using the general social survey. These are seven different religious groups. I'm not going to hit on all of them today because we just don't have enough time, but um, I'll hit on a few of them. This is really the graph that, that, that set, set the world afire. 5% of Americans had no religious affiliation in 1972. That's one in 20. Um, today, according to the GSS, it's closer to 23.5%. And actually, I have some data that says that's a pretty significant undercount. Um, I think the actual number is probably higher than that. I think it's closer to 30% amongst the general population. And we're going to talk about this more in depth in just a minute, but amongst Generation Z and millennials, it's over 40% of young people um, have no religious affiliation. So I even think this is somewhat of an underestimate of the nuns. But here's a couple other groups, evangelicals. Um, evangelicals are actually not in decline in America. If you actually shoot a line between 1972 and 2018, they're actually up just slightly. Uh, in size. They're down from their peak in the early 1990s of about 30%, but in the last 10 years, they've only declined about a point and a half. So, you know, the narrative about evangelicals being in decline is actually not supported by the evidence. This is Catholics. Catholics are actually incredibly stable as well. They've always really kind of bounced around the same sort of span in the data. Nothing really to write home about here, but here's the one that's relevant for this audience especially, because American Baptists are classified as mainline Protestant because we are not as conservative politically or religiously um, as our Southern Baptist cousins. So when it comes to what category we find ourselves in, we are lumped in with groups like the United Methodists and the Episcopalians and the United Church of Christ, and the Disciples of Christ and the PCUSA and the ELCA. Those are our people. Well, in 1976, about 30% of all Americans were mainline Protestant. They were literally the largest religious group in America. Um, and then by 1988, they were 20%. And today, they're about 10%. And in the next 10 years, they're likely to be 5%. The average mainline Protestant today is about 60 years old. Only 15% of Episcopalians have children under the age of 18. It's literally the most childless group, um, religious denomination in America today. The future of the mainline is not looking good, while the nuns are rising rapidly. That's really the only two things that are switching over the last 40 years is nuns are going up, 
mainline Protestants are going down. I mean, the X is what everyone says when they look at that graph. I can I can just see that X. That's what stands out. So question is why? You know, why is this, why are these things happening to us? As as all things in life, it's complicated. You know, I think unfortunately, pastors, and I do this too, I try to oversimplify things during a sermon. But when I put my academic hat on, I have to say, listen, it's a lot more complicated than what you think it is, because it's not one thing, it's thousands of things, right? It's everyone's different. So what I'm going to try to do today is hit the high notes, talk about some of the biggest reasons why people have been disaffiliating over the last 40 years. And then we're going to talk about, you know, some demographics of that, and then things that churches can do to maybe at least stem the tide, um, if not turn things completely around. So first is secularization. So secularization is the idea that as societies become more educated and economically prosperous, they will become less religious. Um, this was first proposed by the German sociologist Max Weber over 150 years ago. And he said that what happens is that science basically takes the place of God. Back in the day when it didn't rain, people didn't know why. And they thought, well, maybe because we made God mad. And if we made God mad, he'll punish us by no rain. We'll have a drought. Or if our you know, child dies uh, of a disease or infection, that's evidence of our sin in our lives. Well, Weber said, well, when science comes along, you don't need that because now you have meteorology and antibiotics, right? So in some ways, science replaces God. And so Weber says, as we get more economically advanced and educationally advanced, we're going to throw off God. Um, he uses this German word, which I'm not going to say, but it's been translated as disenchantment into the English. But actually, a better translation is demagication that you know the world was all magic back in the day you know like why is this happening what what am i what am i doing why did my kid die why is it not raining it's all magic but the process of secularization is the process of demagication now we know why it doesn't rain now we know why our you know people die of disease because we understand virology and immunology and things like this so what weber says is this is going to happen to america and then obviously karl marx comes along it says what's going to happen is people are going to realize that rich people use religion to keep poor people poor and are happy about it, right? He even yeah. uses that famous phrase, religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of the heartless world and the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people, right? That people will get enlightened and they'll realize that, that rich people are using religion as a way to keep you down. You should be happy with your lot in life, is what, what Marx would say. If you look at like American slavery, for instance, slave owners would say, slaves obey, obey your masters as to the Lord. This is your lot in life, right? You have to be a good slave to honor God. So the evidence of this comes from Europe. Um, you know, if you look at a lot of really advanced European countries, you know, the ones that we kind of consider... Um, our, our allies, our counterparts, you know, Great Britain, 12% of the British attend church once a week. Um, you know, Belgium, 8%, Germany's 8%, France is 6%, even Italy. You know, we think of Italy being incredibly Catholic. Three quarters of Italians don't go to mass, right? So, you know, Europe was the leading figure for us and that idea was going to wash its way onto American shores. That secularization was going to come across the ocean. This is a really interesting graph because this is GDP per capita down here. And this is the percent of people who say religion is very important over here, right? And as you can see, that's a negative relationship, everybody, because the line goes down. So the more economically prosperous the less religious you are. And you see that. I mean, these are all the countries we just talked about, Australia, Japan, Sweden, Germany, all down here. But then we've got two outliers, China over here. I think we all know why China is not very religious, right? Because the communism drives out religion. But over here, we've got the United States. We should be a lot. We actually should have about 0% of people saying America is very religious and religion is very important if we fit the trend line. But instead, we have over half of Americans still saying religion is very important. So we are stubbornly religious. We bucked the trend for a long time. And so what really is happening in America is we're just kind of reverting to the mean. You know, we're getting to where we should be if secularization theory is true. So it's really the question is not why America is so secular. It's why is it not more secular? You know, and why is it taking so long is really the way to look at that, at that argument that Weber makes. Other thing, social desirability bias is just the idea that on surveys, people lie a lot about things. You know, 
do you masturbate? Do you do drugs? Are black people lazy? How many sexual partners have you had? Do you think a woman would make a good president? Yeah. Uh, if you think that people are going to answer those questions honestly when looking at someone else in the face, you haven't done any survey research. People constantly lie about everything, but they especially lie about sensitive topics, sex, drugs, racism, sexism. But the other thing that people lie about is religion, um, specifically religious attendance. How often do you go to church? And my, fav my favorite example of that is Ashtabula County in Ohio. Um, there was a survey team that did a survey of residents of Ashtabula County. They asked them, how often do you go to church? About 40% of them, or I'm sorry, 36% of them said they went to church once a week, and then they checked the receipts. The survey team actually called all the pastors in that county and said, how many people do you have in worship last Sunday? And for the pastors who didn't respond, they drove through the parking lots on Sunday morning and counted cars and created like a multiplier effect, how many people per car. And they actually said, the reality is that only about 20% of people in that county in Ohio actually went to church every Sunday. So what we're actually seeing on surveys is maybe not people, we're not seeing actual change in behavior. We're actually just seeing people being more honest about their behavior on these surveys. So we're not really seeing a change as much as we're seeing a revealing of what's really been going on in America for decades and that we've never been as religious as we think we are. It's just people lied about it because it's, be, it's become easier to be a nun today because there are more nuns. And the other thing is we've moved surveys from face to face to online. And we know on an online survey, people will, will be much more honest with a, with, a, with a web browser than they will be with a human being. So we're actually probably getting closer to real answers now. And the answers from 30 years ago are probably more social desirability bias. You can see this in the data, but what's interesting is if I, I thought if I saw this, I would see the number of never attending Christians would go down because they would say they're nuns now and not just say they're Christians who never attend, but we're actually seeing both. The share of never attending Christians has never been higher than it is right now. At the same time, the nuns are going up. So actually, we actually might be even seeing more nuns in the future because these never attending Christians are probably going to become nuns in five or 10 years on surveys because they're going to be more honest as time goes along. Um, and obviously, we, we have to talk about, you know, politics. That's obviously a, a huge part of any discussion. And I'm a political scientist, so I can't just throw it off. Culture wars. Um, racism. I actually recommend you all read this really interesting article by Randall Balmer, The Real Origins of the Religious Right, where he actually argues that the religious right got its foothold in America, not based on things like abortion and gay marriage, but on racism. Um, there was a county after Brown versus Board and desegregation happened. There was a, uh, there was a county in Mississippi called Holmes County, Mississippi, where um, as soon as desegregation was mandated, they started a Christian school in Holmes County. And uh, within two years, there were not a single white student attending the public school in Holmes County, Mississippi. They were all attending the private Christian school. The government then revoked the tax exempt status of the Christian school saying that basically you're, you're practicing racism. And that's actually what activated a lot of Christians to fight against the government and become conservative was this, this idea that you know racism, we wanted to keep our kids away from the black kids. It's a really interesting argument. I don't think a lot of people have heard, but I think it's definitely part of the whole conversation. I also recommend this great book by Kevin Cruz called One Nation Under God, how corporate America invented Christian America. He makes a really interesting argument that a lot of the big preachers in the 50s and 60s are actually paid off by corporations to preach free market gospel, capitalism gospel. Um, and that's how American Christians became so free market based and low taxes and deregulation. Um, and then obviously there's Christian nationalism, which is this really new idea. It's the idea that America is um, a Christian country and we should fight for Christian values. Um, I think this is a very predictive um, a variable and this, you can kind of see it in the data we have here. So this is um, breaking the sample up into people who are liberal, lean liberal, moderate, lean conservative and conservative. Uh, about 40% of people who are liberals have no religious affiliation and it's only about 10% of conservatives. Right. To say this has nothing to do with, with politics is just to miss the point. To be liberal, over half of white liberals today are nuns. Over half of white liberals today are nuns, and it's only about 10% of white conservatives. There's a huge sorting going on in American political and religious life where to be a Christian is to be a Republican, and to be a nun is to be a Democrat. 
So, you know, the idea that there's a home for a lot of um, white Christian Democrats in America is actually becoming less and less true. Of the top 25 predominantly white denominations in America, 21 of them have become more Republican over the last decade, including the United Methodists, uh, the ABC USA, the Episcopalians, okay, churches that tend to or were seen as being liberal are actually not that liberal. So we're seeing this political sorting is driving religious sorting and, and vice versa. Other theories, just real quick, the internet. In the book I talk about, imagine you're an atheist in Alabama in 1960, who are you going to tell? No one. You know, you're going to keep it yourself because you don't want to get kicked out. But now you can go online and Google Alabama atheists and boom, you probably found a subreddit or a, a discussion group or, you know, some place where you can go hang out. And that gives you permission to be what you actually are, right? It gives you permission to reveal who you really are. So I think the internet's actually accelerated a lot of the trends that we've already seen in ways that we're only beginning to understand now. Um, Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone. Putnam argues that we don't do social stuff anymore, that we bowl, we don't bowl in bowling leagues, we bowl alone. Right, we don't do the Elks and the Moose and the VFW and all the things that go along with that. And church got wrapped up in that. Putnam wrote this book in the '90s, and he actually laid the blame for this on cable television, um, which just seems quaint today, antiquated. Um, today, I would say the book would probably be called "Tweeting Alone" or "Facebooking Alone" or "Instagramming Alone" or "Netflixing Alone." Right? It's easier today to be less social and still entertained than ever before in human history. So I think we're becoming less social. And churches just were caught up in that social thing, um, not specifically more so than other groups, but they were caught up in that bigger macro level movement. Um, I talk about trust, especially the Catholic Church, uh, clergy abuse scandal, um, and you know even things like the Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, the televangelist scandals of the 80s and the 90s, even today with prosperity gospel preachers, things like that, um, and the evolution of the American family. You know, uh, we, we see in the data that people who are married are much more likely to go to church than people who aren't married. People with children are more likely to go to church than people without children. And we're seeing marriage rates and child-free rates, you know, marriage rates are going down and child-free rates are going up. So we're seeing less traditional families. And we know that people who tend to go that direction and having less traditional lives also don't go to church because they feel like church reinforces traditional Fam, familial structures and values. So they don't feel, you know, loved and respected there. They don't feel welcome. So they leave. Um, so demographics, let's talk about age, gender, race, education, you know, all kinds of things like that. This is the nuns by um, generation. Um, as you can see, every generation has become less religious as they've aged. I had a buddy tell me one time, he goes, don't people like cram for the final? Like, don't they become more religious as they get old? You know, like, like aren't they going to come back? You know, don't they come? No, the data is actually incredibly clear on this fact. That does not happen. Uh, people actually become less, are becoming less religious as they age. And that's been true for every generation born after 1950. So, I mean, that's just, just factually inaccurate. It's just the rate of disaffiliation changes um, based on the generation. The silence and the greatest are down here. You can see about 10% of them of the silent generation are nuns, so relatively low. Um, boomers, I think it's really interesting that the share of boomers who have no religious affiliation went from about 10% over 15% now. So we're seeing a, a pretty significant increase in that generation's disaffiliation. This is Gen X. They're actually up closer to 20%, but look at this gap here. So this is Gen X and boomers, you know, less than 5%. Not very big, but look at this, Gen X compared to millennials. That's about 12%. I think millennials, there's a clear dividing line between Gen X and millennials in the data where, where Gen X looks a lot more like boomers religiously, but millennials look a lot more like Gen Z religiously. So there's, there's something that happened in American life in you know, the mid-1990s, let's say, when a lot of millennials were coming of age. I was born in 1982, so I'm like one of the oldest millennials. And so I came of age in the 1990s, right? Something shifted in American life at that point where millennials just sort of went their, their a whole different direction. So these are people under the age of 40. Um, they're in a totally different class, I think. And to use, and I talk about this in the book, to use the social science that we looked at from the boomers to project the behavior of millennials is a tremendous mistake. Things are completely different now with younger generations. 
So this is what's called age period cohort, which is actually tracking birth. So these are birth cohorts, people born between 1930 and 1934, people born between 1960 and 1964. As you can see, for most of these birth cohorts, they become more likely to be unaffiliated as they're aging now, right? So up, this line is up, this line is up, this line is up. And even look for the younger generations, it's going up faster. You know, as they age, they're becoming more unaffiliated. They're not returning. And I know what that 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 book you read one time that said that, oh, here's what's going to happen. People are going to leave church when they're kids, but then they're going to get married and have kids of their own, and they're going to come back. No, they're not. Um, there's absolutely no data that indicates they, that they come. It's just up and up now. They're up and out, and they're not coming back. There's no, it's called the life cycle effect. It is not happening anymore. It's just out and out and out. As they age, they become less religious. And this is a good example of, I think I really like the way this visualizes what's going on. So I looked at the share of people who were nuns when they were 18 to 25. So when they were entering adulthood, how, what percentage of them were nuns when they were 18 to 25? So, you know, for people born in the 1950s, it was about 11% of people were, came into adulthood as nuns. So they didn't deconvert. They came, 11% came into adulthood as nuns, but look at it now. Amongst the youngest generation, about a third of, of young people who were born between 19, 1990 and 1994 came into adulthood with no religious affiliation, which is really at least a doubling, if not a tripling of that rate for, you know, from prior generations. So what we're actually seeing now is we're seeing disaffiliation as people age, but we're actually seeing a lot of disaffiliation from generational replacement, that people are coming of age with no religion, and they're replacing people who had religion. Old, old religious people dying off, being replaced by younger nuns is essentially what's happening. We're seeing second and third generation nuns now, something we've never seen before. You know, usually, you know, even 40, 50 years ago, only 5% of the population is nuns. You're not going to have a lot of grandparents who are nuns. So now we're seeing more and more it's become a familial thing. You know, you just are never raised the tradition. You just stick with it as an adult. Um, education stuff, just real quick. There's not a huge education difference, really. And I'm going to talk about in my future book coming out, college doesn't actually make people less religious. Um, there's not a whole lot of evidence of that. The differences here are a lot smaller than you think they are. The whole God's not dead trope of you're going to find an atheist philosophy professor in college and he's going to make you not believe in God is actually not true. Um, religion and, and education actually are positively related in many ways. And you can see here the gap in the nuns here is really only about 5% uh, between people who have a college degree and people who have a high school education. So not a ton there. Um, Let's skip that. This is by gender. Hey, women are um, less likely to be a nun than men are. Men have consistently been about six or seven percent more likely to be a nun. And it's actually kind of scary how parallel those lines are as they go up. Um, they haven't crossed. They haven't. Uh, if anything, women have actually slowed their rate of disaffiliation over the last 10 years or so, and men have kept the pace. Um, so it's sort of opened up just a little bit in the last 10 years, but only a point or two. But you can, I call this the hockey stick graph because it looks like a hockey stick, right? Flat, 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 boom. Something happened around 1990 or so, right? Both graphs start shooting up into the right. Um, I think this is really interesting. So this is by age, and this is from data from 2020. This shows you that men, which is the blue line, are more likely to be nuns when they're young than women are, okay? But then look what happens when they get into their 30s those lines begin to cross. And now the gender gap sort of disappears. Okay. What happens in our thirties? We have kids, we get married, we settle down, but then, and we start looking at the other side of the graph. Look what happens when we get to about 45 years old or so men begin to separate from women. And now we see that older men are significantly more likely to be nuns than older women are. Actually, the largest gap in the data are people in their 60s, the gender gap. It's not amongst young people. It's among the oldest, you know, retirees, empty nesters are really where men sort of go their own direction. And you can see that maintains itself all the way into the 70s. 70 year old men are at least six or seven points more likely to be a nun than 70 year old women are. 
So huge gender gaps there amongst empty nesters and retirees. Something to keep in mind when you're thinking about pastoring a congregation. Um, race, Asian Americans are a lot more likely to be nuns, um, 40%. Um, white, 33%. Black, it's 32%. Hispanic is 29%. Hispanic, Hispanic folks are actually the most likely to have religion in America. Uh, and Asian Americans are the least likely. And you can see the rise. Um, this, that's from 2008 to 2018. You see the rise in the last 10 years. And every group, every group has been affected by this. Okay, not just, not just one, one racial group, but every racial group has been affected um, by disaffiliation. So this is one thing I really want to point out, though, and that is not all nuns are created equal. Um, atheists, agnostics, and nothing in particular. These are the three groups of the nuns. And I think if anything, pastors, I want you to listen to this part because I think this part is super important, okay? Atheists are 6% of the population. Agnostics are 6% of the population. This third group over here, the nothing in particular group, is 21% of the population, okay? 21%. They are tied for the largest religious group in America today. They're about the same size as evangelicals and Catholics, okay? Incredibly large group. We think about the nuns. Don't think about atheists. Think about nothing in particulars, okay? Let's talk about, let's just show you this. This is the data I'm talking about. Atheist agnostics are way down here. Nothing in particulars are way up here, okay? They are the largest and fastest growing religious group in America today. 14% of Americans were nothing in particular in 2008. 21% were nothing in particular in 2020. Seven, they've grown by 50% in 12 years. No group in America grows that fast. It's really sort of amazing we're seeing this kind of growth. Um, age, we see that younger people are more likely to pick the 18 to 20, you know, younger people are more likely to pick atheist and agnostic and less likely to pick nothing in particular. But when you get into older age groups, nothing in particular is more prevalent. Okay. So we're not seeing a lot of old atheists. We're seeing a lot of old, nothing in particulars. It's a different type of faith group. There's nothing in particular group. Uh, age distribution, gender, 60% of atheists are men. If you don't believe me, go on amazon.com right now and look at the top 25 atheist books and see how many of them are written by men. It's almost all of them, okay? Atheism is a, and people, the atheists hate when I say this, but it's facts. They're very male, white dominated, okay? They are exactly what you have in your head. I mean, predominantly ed highly educated, um, agnostics are a little less so 56%, but look, nothing in particular is actually evenly split between men and women. They actually look a lot like America looks like they're not gender imbalanced. This I think is really, really the key. And I want you all to think about this a lot. This is the share of each tradition that has a bachelor's degree or more. Okay. 44% of atheists have a bachelor's degree. They're one of the most educated groups in America today right behind Jews and Hindus, okay? Agnostics are not too terribly far behind them. 40% of agnostics have a bachelor's degree or more, but look at the very bottom of the graph down here. Nothing in particulars are the least educated group in America today. Only one in five, nothing in particulars, has a college degree. They have less education. They have, they're less than half the rate of atheists, so when you have in your head that like the philosophy atheist professor, you know, who's really smart and got a lot of college, that's not what a nun looks like. Three out of five nuns are nothing in particulars. And 80% of those people don't have a college degree. They're not highly educated people. They're actually the opposite of highly educated. They're very, have very low education and it bleeds over into income too. Almost 60% of nothing in particulars make less than $50,000 a year, which puts them in poverty many of them in many communities across America, 60%, only 40% of atheists like make less than $50,000 a year, right? So only 12% of nothing in particular is make more than a hundred thousand as a family income. That's half the rate of atheists or a quarter of them make a hundred thousand dollars a year or more, right? So these groups are demographically completely different. Atheists and nothing in particular and to lump them together is actually, I think in some ways is doing a lot of bad things, more bad things than good things. Politically, I'll just hit on this real quick. Atheists are very liberal, okay? They're down here in the corner. They're very proud of their liberalism. Agnostics are not too far away from them. No, by the way, real quick, black Protestants are not liberals. Do not call them that. They do not like the word liberal at all. They're Democrats. They're not liberals. Because look, they're the furthest to the left on partisanship, but they're not down here with liberal. They're not liberals, okay? 
atheists are liberals, but look at nothing in particular, right? Smack dab in the middle of the distribution. They're not conservative. They're not really liberal. They're sort of, honestly, they're kind of right on top of where the average American is in, in terms of a positioning in partisan space and ideological space. So don't think of them as, as being liberal. Atheists are liberal. They are just moderates in every possible way. Um, they're also not politically engaged. Um, nothing in particular is don't attend meetings. They're half as likely to attend a political meeting as an atheist. Um, they don't do donate money to a candidate. Only 15% of them donate money to a candidate as opposed to 36% of atheists. They're uh, you know, only 8% of them went to a march or a rally. Um, only 12% of them even put up a sign in their yard. They just don't engage in politics. Atheists are incredibly politically active. They're actually the most politically active group in America. Nothing in particular are one of the least politically active groups in America. So, you know, if I painted a portrait, it's of nothing in particular who, who are disengaged from education, you know, have low incomes, are not politically engaged. They're really cut off and isolated from American society. They're not doing well economically, socially, um, spiritually politically they're not they don't have that same activism that atheists do they're completely different in that way and you can even see here that atheist agnostics at the bottom never go to church 90 percent of atheists never go 70 percent of agnostics never go but only 53 percent of nothing in particular is never go right another 27.8 percent says they go seldom but that means you still got a nice little hunk over here of people who go at least once a year or more Amongst, look at this is your, these are all your atheists right here. They never go, right? I wrote a piece with the Gospel Coalition saying, stop debating atheists. It's a waste of time. They're not coming back. Nothing in particular is, are actually, and I'll show you in a second, they're actually much more open to religion than atheists and agnostics are. Um, you know, this is the percentage who say religion is very important or very important for um, nothing in particular is 13%, but another 22% say it's somewhat important. That's 35%. That's not nothing. And remember, remember, this is 35% of 20% of America. So you're talking about what, six, 7% of America is in this group right over here. These people are open to hearing about the gospel. They're open to religion. They're not closed off like atheists and agnostics are. And I think this is the key. I say everything's the key, but this is the key. So this is panel data, which is where we track individual behavior over time. Okay. So they asked people in 2010. 12 and 14, what is your current religious affiliation? Same people. So we can track how individuals move over a four-year period of time. Now, so if you look at atheists, 81% of people who were atheists in 2010 were still atheists in 2014. You know, big shocker there, right? They're not, they're not moving. They're not becoming something else. What percentage of them went and became a Christian? 0.7%. So less than one in 100 atheists became Christians four years later. Okay, let's look at our agnostic friends down here. Four years later, 55% were still agnostic, and then 22% were atheists. 16% became nothing in particular. How many, what percentage became Christians? 3.6%, right? So 0.7, 3.6. Now, this top row is that nothing in particular row, okay? So four years later, 60% of them were still nothing in particulars. But look at this, about... 13% of them became atheists or agnostics, but you know what that leaves? About 25% who went back to a theistic faith tradition. Of that, 16.4% became Christians, right? So this is a group that is willing to try church again, at least five times more likely than agnostics to try church again, at least, you know, 15 times more likely than atheists to try church again. They're, they're actually much more likely, they're much more open to religion. So if I was going to say, where do you target your, your time, your energies, your efforts in terms of bringing people back and bring, winning the nuns over, this is, this is the field here, guys. This is the mission field. The fertile field is right in this row right here. It's not really here and here. And remember, these two rows combined don't equal the, the amount of people that are in this top row, right? So this is a bigger group. And they're more willing to think about religion and come back to religion over time. It's that nothing in particular group that we need to focus on because they're the ones who will listen. They're the ones who won't turn you off, right? This is the way I think about religion. It really looks like this continuum. We have atheism way over here on the side and agnostics are right next to them. But then they have nothing in particular. I think they're the way station between religion and no religion. 
right? Most people who go from here to here go through here first. They go through this transfer station. This is where all the work happens, I think, in American religion is this 20% opening right here. This is where you can convince people who are going this way to come back that way. Or they might not be convinced and go the other way, right? This is where the work happens. This is where we need to target. This is where the return on investment is going to come in, is right here. Not necessarily this over here, but this group right here. So nothing in particulars. So some takeaways. In the book, I say that globalization is the most important force in, 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 in the 21st century. You know, the idea that why are jobs going overseas? Because people work cheaper overseas and it's easier to communicate and transfer stuff now than it's ever been before. And you know what politicians have tried to do for the last 40 years? They tried to stop globalization. And how, how, how good have they done? No. You know, we're going to give subsidies. We're going to do tariffs. We're going to try all these things. And what happens? More jobs go overseas. You can fight it all you want. Globalization is going to happen. In the same way, secularization was going to happen. It was going to sweep over America. And, you know, I grew up in a church. I, I work at a church now that's a lot smaller than it was 20 years ago. And why is that? Is it because I'm a bad pastor? Well, maybe. But it's also because there are some big forces going on in American life. Secularization is sweeping across America. And we were going to be less religious in 2020 than we were in 2000 without a shadow of a doubt, no matter what happened, just because of these forces that were happening. So we need to be cautious of the things we can change and the things we can't change. You can't change globalization. You can't change secularization. It was going to happen anyway, but we can still be mindful of the idea if there are 60 million nuns in America, there are 60 million stories of how the nuns became nuns. I argue in the book that we need to listen to these people, hear their stories, don't have preconceived notions of how they got to where they got. And they might actually tell you some really traumatic stuff about how they were, they were raised in a conservative church and they were a woman and didn't want to preach and couldn't preach. Or they're LGBT and didn't feel welcome. Or they were physically abused, spiritually abused, sexually abused, emotionally abused, spiritually abused by a church. You know, they had really deep and meaningful reasons why they left. But there's also going to be people who say they left just because they moved the church service up half an hour and they didn't want to get up any earlier. Or they got a new pastor and they didn't like the new pastor, right? If there's 60 million nuns, there's 60 million stories of why we got those nuns. I try to be generalizing because I have to as part of my job, but you shouldn't do that all the time. Listen to people, hear their stories, try to understand how they got there. Pastors, this is so key. Stop being so partisan. Now, notice I didn't say stop being political. I said stop being partisan, right? Don't be a self-fulfilling prophecy. And by the way, I know, I know the data is clear on this. Most pastors don't preach politics from the pulpit, but they have this pulpit online. It's called Facebook. And I have a lot of pastor friends who are, who are uh, on Facebook. And boy, a lot of them are incredibly partisan on that Facebook. And it's almost always for one party and against the other. Are you telling the people in your community, if you voted for someone that I don't agree with and you're not, you're not welcome in my church? Why are we, Michael Jordan was asked, why are you not more political? And he said, because Republicans buy tennis shoes too right? Do not independents and Democrats deserve the gospel? I think they do. I think there's a lot of good people out there who vote for Democrats who could be good Christians, but they don't find a church that's welcoming to them because the churches are being overly partisan. It's almost always in white churches towards the Republican side. I would, by the way, I would say the same thing. It was the other way. It's not about being Republican or Democrat. It's about being open to the gospel, right? What I say is we need to start teaching our people to think about politics in a theological way. And Imago Day is a great way to do that. It's the idea that every human being is created in the image and likeness of God. And that means that the unborn deserve respect, just like the illegal immigrant deserves respect. Every human being is born in the image and likeness of God. We need to teach theology that cuts across political lines, that makes the Democrats and the Republicans look bad. Because guess what? Neither of them represent kingdom values. Okay? That's not where our allegiance lies. Politics will not save you. It will not redeem you. And I think we've all recognized that over the last couple of years. It just actually divides us worse. So pastors, if you're going to be political, give it to both sides equally. Point out when this party's wrong and when that party's wrong and when they disagree with the gospel, because I think they both do. Um, so stop being so partisan. But I do think there's an incredibly fertile field out there. You know, I love the parable of the sower, right? The impetus on the parable of the sower is simply this. Our job is to throw the seeds. You know, the condition of the soil is getting a little bit worse every year, but that doesn't stop our exhortation to not throw seed. Our job is to continue to throw seed. And now I think we can throw it a little bit more strategically than we've been doing, right, to certain groups, which I've just laid out. But at the end of the day, it's not on us, right? It's not on us to, to, to determine what happens with the seed. Our job is just to keep throwing and throwing and throwing 
and eventually there's going to be a harvest. So, you know, don't give up, keep throwing seed, but be smarter about how you're throwing that seed and who you're throwing it to. So you're not wasteful of the resources that God gave all of us and we can get a more bountiful harvest. So I'll stop there. And I think there might be a question or two. I would say that is true, Ryan. And it's, I got to say, thank you, obviously, for all that you've shared. It's been like drinking from a fire hose, but uh, appreciate that. Uh, one of the questions that was just asked by Todd McClure said, it seems like most of your research has been focused in the U.S. However, if these same trends are being seen globally and in other religions, I would assume this presents us with a fertile mission field. Any insights on that? Yeah, so I don't do a lot of international stuff um, for a bunch of reasons because I'm just very, I don't understand religion. Religion in America is so unique, you know, compared to other countries. But I will say that secularization is a universal concept that's going to come across, you know, so we're seeing a lot of growth in Christianity in places like Africa and Central and South America. I think that's going to eventually wane as secularization takes over in those places as well, right? This is an inevitability at least as we understand it from a social science perspective. So I think that while we're seeing growth in those places, I wonder how long that growth is sustainable, let's say in 30 years or 40 years or 50 years as those places continue to develop. So I think the, the tools that we learn in America on how to reach out to the mission field will still be applicable to those places in 30 and 40 years because the same process that's happening in Europe 50 years ago is happening in America today. It's going to happen in sub-Saharan Africa 50 years from now. So we can still learn from what these concepts, but we need to apply them in a new context. I wish I could predict what that context is going to look like in 50 years, but I can't. Chris uh, Roush asked uh, as well, uh, what are the sources for the stats shared? I know you shared those in your mm -hmm. book, but if you could just highlight those. Yeah, yeah. So the General Social Survey, GSS, is done by the National Opinion Research Council. It's done every two years since 1972. It's sort of the gold standard social science research. Um, the other, and where a lot of the data from this comes from, is called the Cooperative Election Study, put together by Harvard University, beginning in 2008. The great thing about the CES is the sample size. So in the 2016 sample, there were 64,600 respondents. In the 2020 sample, there were 61,000 respondents. So that means I had 3,700 atheists in the 2020 sample, which is larger, by the way. The general social surveys, each wave averages 2,200 people in total. Right. So I can't even do real big analysis of these small groups with the GSS. The CES allows me to do this really like deep dig and dive into a lot of these smaller groups because I have thousands of them, not dozens of them. So that's my two main data sources, General Social Survey and the Cooperative Election Study, which are both freely available, by the way. You can download them right now. Frank, there are additional questions there. Were you able to catch that last one I reposted? <clears throat> yeah, sure. Happy to share it. Um, your slide showed that under current conditions, nothing in particular have the most numbers of, of folks affiliating with the religion. Uh, do you think that there could be any way that current conditions, practices could be changed to increase the number of agnostics and atheists that become affiliated with a religion? I think it's less likely. Um, I think I think there's um, even in America as things have changed and cultures change. There's still a lot of stigma against the atheist and agnostic label. And actually, in the book, I show that <laughs> even amongst Democrats, atheists rank second to the bottom in in favorability. The only group that ranked lower was the Tea Party. This was in 2012. So even Democrats don't like the word atheist. And huge percentages of Americans say they would not elect an atheist president, let's say, or want their children to marry an atheist. So there's to take on the atheist or agnostic. Um, label is to embrace all the baggage that comes with that. And if you're willing to embrace the baggage, it means you really truly believe this stuff. You're not just sort of passing through through a stage. So I think once you get to that level, I think there's not a whole lot of turning back. Now we all know stories like those, you know, like those stories we hear in church of I was an atheist, devout atheist, and then I found God at a, you know, whatever it was, and I, you know, became a, an evangelical Christian or whatever. Those stories are great, but they're also incredibly rare, right? We need to make sure that anecdotes are not how we guide the way that we act and behave. And we, the extreme story sticks in our head. The average story does not, right? And the average story is people kind of vacillate in and out of religion over time, but most atheists who become atheists just don't come back. They are actually trying to actively persuade other people 
to become atheists. No, 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 nothing in particular is actively evangelizing for nothing in particular. You know, they're just, they're just stuck in the middle. Atheists want you to come to their side and they want to grow there and they love to see their numbers growing. So I just don't see any evidence of any ways to reach out to that group in a meaningful way that would not actually have a backfire effect and actually make them more reticent and more unlikely. We've actually seen that with the vaccine, by the way. All the things we've tried, it actually has made more people hesitant to get the vaccine. So I think sometimes we can have that same effect with atheists and agnostics. By trying to convince them of anything, you're actually going to convince them of the opposite of that, and they're going to dig their heels in even worse. So I don't know if I have any good advice on how to reach out to atheists or agnostics. I think it's just a better use of our time to focus on the nothing in particulars right now. Tim Hughes also uh, made a comment. So you said 60 million nuns equals 60 million stories is certainly true, but is there a general theme a church may use to reach those nothing in particulars? Uh, what in general may connect with the heart of a nothing in particular? Yeah, so I think we're, the church is in a very unique time because of coming out of the COVID you know, lockdowns. I think people are dying to be social right now. They wanna come back to church. They wanna come back to do anything with other people. And so what I would recommend is that churches think about being more social and less spiritual in the next six months. You know, let's have a barbecue. Let's have a potluck. Let's have a, a, a horseshoe tournament. Let's have a bags tournament. Let's go outside, you know, so people can still feel safe and comfortable outside. But let's just invite people and don't hand out a track and don't make them fill out a contact card and don't hand them a Bible the first thing that, you know, when they get there. Just let people eat and, and enjoy company and play games and let the kids run around the lawn and, you know, take advantage of the facility. Like just create space for people to be social, right? I think... I think the reality is that pastors are always, this sounds so weird, they're always stuck on the, like the evangelization thing, right? I think a lot of people come to church for the wrong reasons and then stay for the right reasons. So give them a bunch of wrong reasons to stay. And you know what? Free food's a great way, a great wrong reason to come to church. I mean, that's kind of what we're known for. So create space, and but no obligations to them, right? Don't create strings attached and do it once a month or once every two weeks, or just be constantly doing, especially as the weather gets better, you know, between May and October, we have an ideal ideal window that opens where people want to go out. They want to be social. And I think a lot of people, we're seeing this in the data, by the way, one of the reasons that un unemployment's been so high is people are rethinking what they're doing for jobs. And they're actually not getting back in the job market because they want to do something different. I think people are doing that spiritually too. They, a lot of them have really self-evaluated over the last 12 months, realizing, am I, do I want to get closer to God? Am I, am I drifting away? Give them an opportunity to, to dip their toe in without beating them over the head with you know evangelism and the bible and the roman road of salvation and all those things just create an opportunity for them to come to your church hang out enjoy each other and you know what if one percent comes back you've succeeded vastly more than you ever could in any other way so just create space and and, and see what happens from that point forward now arlen uh, vernava said uh, i'm an intentional interim it trains interims one great posture or approach uh, approach nuns as if you're an emotional or spiritual and anthropologist just be with others there's so much value in just being in community with people and i think people realize a lot of people and this is something that i think that pastors never think about is we call we we said there's two dimensions there's a vertical religious dimension and the horizontal religious dimension. And most people think religion's all about the vertical, but a lot of people go to church who don't even believe in God because they like the social aspect of the whole thing. Let's not downplay that. That's okay. You know, like that's what people are like, I'm glad that people who don't believe in God don't go to church. I'm like, you don't want them to hear the gospel. Like I'm cool. With, you're, you're behind in the seat for whatever reason it is. So let's just let people be with us you know, sit with us during worship and sit with us in the coffee hour afterwards and sit with us. And you know what they want? If they get sick, they want food dropped off on their front porch, right? Their kid, they want, they want you know, have a cheering section at the t-ball game for their kid. They just want to feel supported. They want to feel like they're part of a community and just, just support them, just love them without strings, without obligations, without like, an alt they don't want to feel like you're loving them with an ulterior motive. Just love them because they're human beings and they matter right? I think that is the way that you win nothing in particular is bad. Because like I talked about, I think they're so disaffected and disaffiliated and unmoored from American society. They need some connection. Help them. Help them get connected. Because remember, these people are not, they're not rich. A lot of them have kids. They're struggling economically. They probably need babysitters. You know, they just need help. Help them. That's really what my, my advice would be is just, just help them and then see what happens from there. Yeah, John Landon. 
Go ahead, Charles. Hey, Frank, could I just jump in real quick? Sure. It really captured my imagination, Ryan, when I read your book and came to the conclusions at the end that we're really talking about a sociological strata in America that the church has forgotten or hasn't focused on. And in our region, we've been uh, emphasizing fresh expressions, especially dinner church. And in the training that we received about dinner church, uh, the main, one of the main takeaways was dinner church was an sociological approach that mirrored the first, second, and third century church that opens up uh, welcoming in a social strata among low-income people, people that are not comfortable in organized gatherings of any type whatsoever. They're, so, they're uh, socially awkward, and dinner church opens up to them a very easy, non-threatening avenue to come and hang uh, with believers and followers of Jesus. And I thought, that just tells us that our strategies aren't working. We need to embrace new strategies, new creative strategies to get among the people, uh, take the church out among uh, the disaffected, the nothing in particulars. Uh, are there any other ideas like that that have come to your mind as you've done this research? I think that that pastors, you think they're careful about social media strategy too. Yep. You know, like social media is a huge way that people connect now. And I think pastors, you know, a lot of us were not trained, but we were trained before social media. So it wasn't part of like seminary training or any, you know, any vocational training that we, we've received. But we need to think about how we position ourselves on social media, right? In terms of what kind of message are we giving to the average person? And are we trying to, are we making everything about the pastor and the preaching and the music and all that stuff? How about just, here's a picture of us having a barbecue in the backyard. Here's us at the last potluck we had you know, show a picture of people who are of different backgrounds, economic, racial, you know, kids, adults, old people all together, you know what I mean? Like showing the church as it exists. And even, and I think this actually might be an interesting strategy to try. Just think about this. Have some of your people who have come to your church and joined in the last year or two, describe why they joined. What was the thing that helped them you know, feel like they were welcome and belong. Tell personal stories. And they could be videos or they could just be text. And maybe other people read those and go, okay, I get why this works for them. And that actually is something I'm looking for too. So, you know, that's social media. I think we really, churches have, we never had websites for a long time. That was a mistake. Now we're not doing well with social media. I think Facebook is the key, you know, way to reach out to people, but we need to be very careful. And I do think this is a perfect opportunity, by the way, to recruit young people in your church to help to get, you know, to get that messaging just right and try different stuff. Don't be afraid to try videos, try pictures, try, try text and, and, and position yourself in such a way that your church does not seem like it's just so religious that it's not about people either. It needs to be about people first. And then, then the religious stuff comes secondary to that. But I think that's something to really think about going forward. Marilyn had a, a couple of questions, Ryan. Uh, she yeah. said, in looking over the data, that sweet spot seems to be 1988. What was happening then? Uh, the Christian school movement was strong during that time. And then secondly, and I think this certainly relates to the challenges we're facing as we come out of this pandemic. She said, does your data only view people who are not attending church or does it also include people who are going to church online? Similar to the mega church movement where people can be nourished spiritually in, the, in an anonymous fashion, which I think will be more likely in the future. And that's, that's certainly one of the challenges that we're confronting as we engage with pastors is how how do you have this distributed church which is both in present present face to face but then also have this online component how does that impact what we're talking about today yeah so let's tackle each of them in turn so the 1988 thing i think the early 90s were a real turning point in america that's when televangelism really hit its peak you know guys like baker and falwell and robertson really kind of dominated the airwaves in the 1990s but that's also when when the Southern Baptist Convention did its hard turn to the right, and that really became evidenced in the in the early 1990s, that the conservative takeover at Louisville Seminary happened in 1993, for instance, right? So we see that the traditional, the large denominations in America, the Southern Baptists dominated really uh, Protestant life in America in the 90s, took that hard turn to the right and started calling churches like ours, by the way, not really Christian, right? So they really started telling mainline Protestants that unless you believe what we believe, then you're a heretic, right? You're, you don't belong with us. And I think they had a cleaving effect on American religion where a lot of mainline Protestants go, well, if you keep saying I'm not a Christian, then maybe I'm not a Christian. I want to become a nun. 
So I'm just going to leave because I'm sick of being called names. I do think it actually made some mainline Protestants evangelicals, by the way, too. But the other thing that happened is politically, abortion became a, a central topic of debate. Summer of Mercy happened in 1991, which is this nationwide protest movement. Abortion clinic bombings hit their peak in the early 1990s. But you know what happened in 1994? Newt Gingrich, contract with America. Republicans won huge shares of the House of Representatives, which they had not done for decades. And politics really took a turn for the vicious in the early 1990s. I think there was really a cleaving thing, like a, I think Moses in the Red Sea right, of parting people one way or another. You're either with us or you're against us. Politics started taking on that tone, and I think religion also began to take on that tone at that point, too, where especially evangelicals were very willing to say to Catholics and mainline Protestants, you're not with us. We're not with you. We're not. We're on the same team here. I think that drove a lot of people away. So that's the, that's the 19, that's what I think happened in the early 1990s, and I think that kicked the ball down the hill, and then it just rolled on its own momentum right? That just sort of kicked off this whole change. And then the internet accelerated that lack of trust accelerated that boom, boom, boom. And just things started rolling from there. So I think something happened there that really kind of let things go. Um, what was the other question, Frank? Related to the, the uh, acceleration of online connection yeah. with congregations mm-hmm. and kind of how does that jive with what we're experiencing through this pandemic? So interestingly enough, the data I have They asked the question the exact same way in November of 2020. They asked it in November of 2019, and the church attendance of Americans did not change at all. And they did not add an online caveat to it. So if you look at the data, there's nothing in the data that says that people are actually attending church less now. And I've seen cell phone tracking data, which, by the way, your cell phone does track you, and you can buy your cell phone tracking data, anonymized, Um. And it looks like church attendance has actually gotten to about 95% of what it was pre-pandemic already. So I'm not seeing a ton of evidence that says that people are abandoning in-person worship in droves. I do think we're actually going to get back to baseline probably in the next three or four months as vaccines accelerate, as you know, summer opens up, all those kind of things. I do, I, and there is tons of evidence, by the way, from not work I've done, but other social scientists that say that online community is not real community, right? It does not have the same ties. It does not create the same positive benefits that we see from, you know, in-person communities. So I think that churches need to be very cognizant and aware that just because we have a big following online doesn't mean we have a big following. And we should not, um, I think churches are going to have to have a serious conversation in the future of, are we having large numbers of our people not show up because they can just watch it online? I don't think that's a healthy trade-off for churches, for individual members, for the kingdom. I don't think you should shut the online off, but we need to think carefully about getting, encouraging and nudging people to get back into worship in person when they feel obviously, you know, physically comfortable doing so, but online should not be the way that we do church predominantly in the future. One of our, uh, regional executive colleagues, Mike Sisson from West Virginia said, uh, George Hunter argues that belonging precedes believing out of the Celtic way of evangelism. Yeah, that, I think that's true. I think that's absolutely true. So that actually brings up a really good point. So there's what we call the three B's, behavior, belief, and belonging. Behavior is like church attendance. That's the first thing that goes. People, about 40% of Americans never attend church now. So that's way higher. But then we talk about affiliation, which is only about 25%. But this is super interesting. Belief is the last thing that goes. 90% of Americans, even today, still believe in God at some level. They do not have an atheist or agnostic worldview. Okay. So 40% never go to church, but only 10% have an atheist or agnostic worldview. And really, if you look at where those three circles overlap, like in the Venn diagram, It's only about 6% of Americans don't believe, don't belong, and don't behave. So like they're none, none, nuns. Like they're nuns on all dimensions, right? But I do think that belonging is something that we don't think about enough, but I think it's incredibly important. Like on a survey, me saying I'm a Christian still means something even if I don't go to church. It still means I want to, or at least I aspire to be a Christian. It's still a value that has more positive than negative in my own mind. And I think that's still a win for Christianity because people could easily pick something else and they don't. So I think there's, there's something to be said for that for sure. Lots of 
good questions <clears throat> been asked. Uh, does anybody else want to put one in? Or you could unmute yourself and speak up. So we'd just ask you to uh, mute yourself back afterwards. Yeah, I, I do have a question. This is Mike Lee from Chinese Baptist Church. Go, Mike. I'm joining. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Ryan, appreciate the, uh, the uh, good uh, Q&A time. So my question is, I, I understand the entry point of, hey, let's just get people engaged. Uh, don't get too spiritual. Bring them to church or spiritual community but you know don't get too crazy with them right okay so i understand that but like what do you what are some suggestions like at what point do we get spiritual at what point can we go beyond just hey come let's eat tacos right mm -hmm. but get mm -hmm. to the gospel yeah i think it needs to be i think your p that's a great question i think the people your people who so what's going to happen is they're going to come to the barbecue or come to the tacos or whatever a couple times I think the people that seeing are seeing them come two or three times to those events need to start gradually nudging them and saying, just mentioning that we have church on Sunday, or we have a small group that meets in my house or that house or wherever it is. And you know, you're more than welcome to come to, and this, and this family comes and those people over there come too. And you know, those people, right? So start making those connections, you know, like slowly and gradually, but I don't think that it comes, it should come from the leadership of the church. I think it should come from the members who are the most closely connected to the people that are coming, right? So the people that, are, that sit next to them at the picnic table at the barbecue need to be the one making the suggestion and don't do it the first time. Again, wait, wait till they warm up and start meeting other people in the congregation and going, okay, these three or four families all meet in the same small group on Tuesday nights at seven. If you want to come to that, you know, you're more than welcome. We'd love to have you. And that start that way, right? Or just say worship is at 11 o'clock on Sunday. You know, you can sit with me. So let that happen as organically as it possibly can. But I think when we talk about that backfire effect, I think we got to be really careful that we don't come on too strong. Roll it out there one time. And if it takes, good. If it doesn't, wait two more times. Don't, you know, every time, because what's going to happen is they're going to feel like they're being, they're, they're, they're a project or they're a target. No one wants to feel that way. They want to feel like they're loved and cared for, and they need to be approached in a loved and cared for way. And I think a lot of that is subtle and it's slow and it's, it's going to be lumpy progress, uneven progress. So I think it needs to happen at the congregational level. And I think there actually might need some discussion from the pulpit about how to do things like that. You know, don't turn people off with your evangelism efforts. Don't be overzealous. Let's let these things happen organically. The leadership is going to create structure to make that happen, but we need you the congregation to actually do the work once we've created the environment to make something like that happen. I think that's the best way to approach it. I'd like to jump in again here with this conversation, Ryan. Again, great points. Excellent. Thank you, Mike Lee from Chinese Seattle Baptist uh, for the question. I, I've been really impressed by a book by Rick Richardson out of Wheaton and the Billy Graham evangelistic evangelism uh, uh, group. Uh, called You Found Me. Uh, and he likewise goes into statistics about what's going on with the nuns and how to reach them. And the bottom line in that book that I found was number one things churches could uh, up their game when it comes to connecting with uh, nothing in particular is simply be, learn to be hospitable. And one level of that is just teaching people or training people, helping them to be friends with the unchurched, how to truly be a friend with the unchurched uh, how to enter into spiritual conversations with them. And if it takes 10 years, it's a 10 year friendship, uh, regardless of whether they ever come to church or not. And I think that's one of the, our difficulties. We don't know just how to hang in a natural way, in an authentic, real transparent way with folks that are everyday people. And that day is coming when they're gonna go through some kind of a crisis, a life crisis, something happens to a child, and they're gonna turn to their friends and especially a friend that just simply says, hey, can I pray with you, pray for you? Uh, I care deeply. And I, I, to me, I, I think that's a huge piece in this conversation. Again, that thanks, Ryan. This is awesome. Yeah, I was thinking about that, Charles. I think we also think from the, the pulpit, if you're doing a lot of us versus them discussion from the pulpit, you're actually making your life a lot harder. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because now it seems like if they're out there, they're them. Guess what? There is no them. There's only us. Okay. And that's my conception of the world is, and Charles and I talked about this yesterday. I think Christians need to think more about building bigger tables, right? When we create us versus them, they become them. And now we don't, we don't know how to relate to them. They're the world. 
You know what they are? They're, he, they're you. Remember Imago Day? Every human being is born in the image and likeness of God. That's what we need to talk about, right? And so if, if your people are struggling to connect with people, it's because you've, you've made them think in dualities, good versus bad, us versus them, in versus out. Stop messaging that way, <laughs> you know? Start talking about us, we, we're together, right? They're not our enemies. They're just different than us, and that's okay. You know, I think we need to be thinking about what our pulpit, our sermons are doing to people and how it, it rearranges the, the framework and the way they think about the world in their minds and what that does to their behavior. Is it actually making the kingdom better? Is it making our church stronger? Is it making their lives better or worse? These are really important questions. And I don't think a training, you know, doing a training on this helps overcome it in one hour. I think it comes from right. the pulpit for, you know, for years to help change their minds about how they view the world. That I think is so incredibly important. In, in our church, you know, we were we were an old white conservative church. One day we had, you know, I've been trying to make our congregation think this way for decades, you know, for over a decade now. We had a young man come with his grandmother and he came forward during invitational time. He said, I want you all to pray for me. I'm addicted to drugs and I'm going to rehab today. And boy, everybody came up and just loved on him and hugged on him. Like, you know, like he was one of them. And I bet they wouldn't have done that five or 10 years before because that's them. And we don't want to pollute ourselves with them, right? They're us. We're them. We're all together in this. We're all struggling together. I think getting our congregation to understand that will make us more porous in terms of people. It's easier to come in when they see when that, that barrier is torn down between the church and the world. And unfortunately, I think too many pastors like to, like to build a bigger barrier, not a smaller one. So I think we need to think about messaging as well. One of the questions that came to Ryan, and it's a particular one for your situation, is what particular strategies are you using in the church where you serve? Um, that's a, that's a great question. And to be candid, we're not, um, we have about 15 people now and they're all over the age of 75. And we're just, I'm, I, I consider myself a hospice pastor. Um, my job is to guide the church as best I can through this, this ending period of our, our life. Um, and, and we, you know, for a long time, we tried to grow, we tried different strategies to grow. We tried to, you know, be more inclusive, but it's really hard to be inclusive to young families when the average age of your congregation is 75. Um, we just found that we had sort of gotten past the point of no return in terms of being able to turn it around. And we were beating our heads against the wall and getting depressed and feeling defeated by trying all these things and them not working. So instead what we did, and I talk about this in the book is we said, what can we do to serve the community as best we can for as long as we can while we still exist. And so what we started was a Brown bag program called Brown bag Friday, where we pack about 12 items in a Brown paper sack for about uh, 250 kids in the local school. Cause we have a, we have a very low income, 84% of our kids are on free or reduced lunch in the public school. So we take that bag to school on Fridays and the social workers distribute it to the kids who need food over the weekends because a lot of them would go hungry on you know, a Saturday or a Sunday because their families just don't, don't have food. And that has been such a point of pride for us the last 10 years. I mean, we, our entire budget for our church now is about $30,000. We spend $10,000 a year on Brown Bag Friday. I mean, it's 25% it's of all the money that we raise goes to this one program because we're so darn, it's become our purpose is to feed hungry kids. And all we do is we put in the bag a little card that says, we're First Baptist Church and we don't know you, but we love you. Here's some food, enjoy it. If you need anything, here's our number, feel free to call. Well, one time we had a, a, a lady call us on a Friday after she got in the bag. She goes, my grandson came home with the bag. Thank you for the food. Uh, I take care of him because his parents can't, but it's, it's winter is coming and he, he doesn't have a coat and I can't afford a coat. Can you help us? We were doing a rummage sale in the fellowship hall that weekend. We literally had racks and racks of clothes. And we said, come on down, bring, you know, you can take anything that you want from, from any of these racks. And they took three huge uh, bags of clothes and took them home. And I never knew that kid's name and I never knew the grandmother's name and I didn't want to ask, but you know what? That kid's going to leave there. And when he talks about church and faith, I hope he thinks, you know what? I don't go to church, but the church loved me. You know, they cared about me when no one else did. They don't even know me and they love me. So if that just turns their, his mentality, just 5% warmer towards church, then we've won. You know, we've, we've done it. We've, we've thrown the seed. We've done what God called us to do. And if that raises up another Billy Graham from that, then I've got another great story. And if it doesn't, I still got a good story, right? So it's not my job to figure out what happens with the seed once it's thrown. It's just to throw the seed. So what I, I, I always tell churches in our spot is you need to figure out, answer this question for yourself. 
if our church closed down tomorrow, would anyone outside our membership really care? Figure out the answer. If the answer is no, then you messed up. You need to figure out one thing that you do. If you close, people in the community are going to be hurt by you not existing anymore because that means you're serving other people more so than you're serving yourself. So find ways to serve your community and love them. And we've done that. And now we're actually in a position where we can't, we're probably not going to exist much longer, but we got to figure out how to get those kids fed now, which is a problem, but it's a good problem because we created it, you know, because of the good work that we've done for the last 10 or 11 years. So that's, that's what we're doing right now. And we're, we're going to die. Our church is going to close in probably the next three or four years but we fed 10,000 bags every year for the last 10 years. And I think that's a legacy that we can all be proud of. I use an interesting word there, one that I've tried to push for years. Um, and that's the word legacy. And mm -hmm. when you have a, a church that's in that position, critical question is what is the legacy you want to leave? And I think the second piece that you bring to the table here is I, I'm, I don't make a lot of friends because I say two of the worst pieces of theology we engaged in was church equals building and church equals Sunday morning. And if we get to the point where we say, I don't care, and we do, and I'm in the same condition you are, by the way, I've served those churches my whole life. But if we get to the point where we say, you know what, I don't care that you sit in a pew in my sanctuary. Did we have an impact? Did we bring you in contact with Christ and let the Holy Spirit do the work? And if you live somewhere else as a quote unquote church member, so be it. Um, and until we, I think we get to that, I think until we get that to that mentality, we're going to have lots of nuns and sadly even more duns. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim asked, why is our church going to die? Because because we got 15 people who are all 80, 80 years and older, and they're going to all physically die in the next 10 or 15 years. I'm doing a, I'm doing a lot of funerals. I mean, de demographics are destiny in some ways. And, you know, we were 300 people in 1960, and we were 100 people in 1997, and we were 50 people in 2006, and now we're 15 people in 2020. You know, so th the thing is, I stepped into a, a boulder that was already running downhill. You know, that's the one thing I had to come to reality. The thing that happened, happened 30 years ago. It didn't happen because of me or, you know, like, so I think I can sit around and bang my head against the wall and be depressed, or I could do the best with what I have with what God gave me in the situation that we're in. I think everyone in my congregation would say the same thing is we feel like we're doing God's will for our church and our community and the kingdom. And that's really all you could ever ask for, you know, is a congregation that believes that and acts that out every day. And whether your church grows to a million or dies tomorrow, that's not, uh, that's not for me to worry about. My job is to do the best we can with what we have for as long as we can. And I think we're doing that. Uh, there's a question that's been, I think, skipped over that Chris Rausch uh, posed earlier uh, a few, several minutes ago. She says, the partisan conversation is of particular interest. Mm -hmm. I see more and more young people walking away because they equate religion with politicians, they do not see acting in ways that Jesus talks about. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing this in trends? Yeah, for sure. So in the 1970s, half of mm -hmm. white weekly churchgoers were Democrats and 35% were Republicans. Today, it's 50% of Republicans and 25% are Democrats. We've seen this com complete reversal of, of what religion and politics means I'm a big believer that the church is the best when it had Republicans, Democrats, and independents sitting shoulder to shoulder in the pews every Sunday because it became a common meeting ground where we all looked at each other and said, hey, I don't think you're a bad person just because you vote for the other guy. You know, like you're not a bad person because you're a Republican or you're a Democrat. We're all just different and that's okay. Unfortunately, what we're seeing now is we've demonized the other side, right? We've, we created caricatures of what the other side looks like where church used to build bridges from one side to the other. Now the church is just all one thing or the other, you know? And so now we're not seeing that, that bridge building. And I think a lot of young people are completely turned off by the church's view. And I'm just going to be dead honest with LGBT. I think 75, 80% of young people are totally fine with LGBT and cannot imagine why you would not be okay with LGBT people, you know, affirming, opening church. 
Um, and if that's against your doctrine, I get it. That's totally fine. And I, I know someone's saying right now, well, I'm glad we don't do our doctrine based on public opinion. I'm glad you don't either, but you got to understand the people that you're trying to reach disagree with your doctrine. Full stop. Like facts, facts are facts, whether you like them or not. So the, that's one thing is LGBT. The other thing is women pastors, which I, we're all IBC here. So we're all in one boat, but 70% of evangelicals are in favor of female pastors preaching on Sunday from behind the pulpit, 70%. I think a lot of young women, especially with the Me Too movement, have actually gotten to a place in life where they realize, hey, we deserve some, you know, some leadership here. We deserve to have access to things that we haven't gotten access to a long time. Evangelical churches are especially bad, poorly positioned to do those things, but I think we need to be thinking about young people care about things the church has consistently been on the other side of for a long time, and I think people want to live a congruent life. It's really hard to be a Democrat in, in a Christian in America today, if not impossible, especially if you're white. I think so people are going, you know what? I just won't go. It's easier to not go. And I'll call myself a nun, even though I would be a Christian if I could find a church that would be a home for me. I think churches should be, should, we should think very carefully about how we've caused this to be worse. And I also think that it's only going to get worse, unfortunately. I don't see any end to polarization. I think social media has made it worse. And I think it just feeds on itself. In the book, I talk about the spiral of silence, which is this communication term, which is the idea that if you're in a group of people, you figure out really quickly what the dominant worldview is. And if you have a different worldview, you just shut up because you don't want to be singled out. You know, we, we want to fit in. That's our human nature is to fit in. But the problem is with that is people assume that silence is complicity, right? If you don't speak up, then you agree with the majority. And unfortunately, that's not the case. You know, so we're, we're dealing with these issues. I think pastors, by the way, should create space for people who have dissenting opinions to speak those opinions in a loving and caring way that will not lead there to their ostracization, ostrac whatever it is, being ostracized from the church, right? Maybe it's a, maybe it's a anonymous comment box. Maybe it's just talking to the pastor individually. Maybe it's a pastor offering that, hey, if you disagree with me, will you come talk to me afterwards about this? You know, doing things like that, I think, is so incredibly important for people who struggle with faith, who doubt, right? I think we need to create space for those people who are a Democrat in a Republican congregation or a Republican or Democrat congregation or someone who doesn't believe in hell in a congregation of people who do. You know, let's create space for people to ask questions and be honest. We're going to be a lot better off if we do those things. Awesome. Frank? Can I... Uh... Uh, just mention, I am I am a retired pastor, hospital chaplain, and hospice chaplain. I am now a member of a church. My mission is in a Waffle House and two bars. My object is to get to know people and to hear what's going on in their life. I think that our, the parishioners in our church are not connecting with these people that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. That we have to go to where they are yep. and get to know them as friends. Uh, I, I, I have to be honest with you. I, I talked to a fella who was a uh, Vietnam vet at the bar. And he was just completely destroyed over the way the United States has, has affected him. Hmm. He was not welcome back. Mm -hmm. He explained to me the pain that was going on. And at the bar, I looked at him and I said, would you like to have prayer? And he looked at me like, yeah. And we had prayer at the bar. And when we finished praying, he gave me a coin. And that coin says he was a member of the Pataskala, Ohio, uh, veterans uh, uh, of Vietnam. He said, I'm giving you this coin. And he said, anytime you talk to a vet who's been to Vietnam, you lay that on the counter and you've got an open door. We need to be doing this. I don't do this because I'm a clergy. I do this because the early church did it. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Very good.
That's Thank a good you word. Very much. Uh, I like that. As Motiv- we're uh, kind of starting to wind it down here, Ryan, I want to make sure you have a chance to talk about this. Yeah, how yeah. To, well, it's getting it. blurred out, but uh, yeah, please yeah. buy my book. Uh, it's on Amazon. <laughs> there it is. Right, Frank's got one right there. Yeah, there we go. The nuns. Uh, it's 160 pages, 42 graphs, 31,000 words. Most people read the book in a day. I've had many people tell me they've read the book in a day. It's a quick read, a lot of graphs, but I try to explain it in, in, in language that anyone can understand. Um, it's through Fortress Press. Um, I, I'm going to have another book coming out in, in next March called 20 Myths About Religion and Politics in America. And it's just a bunch of 10 chapters on religion myths that you believe and 10 myths on political and religion stuff that you believe. For instance, like old people are more likely to be religious. We talked about that. That's not true. Evangelicals are in decline. That's not true. There's all these things that we believe. Oh, that lots of people have radical conversions to Christianity. That's also not true. There's just all these things that we believe that pastors have unfortunately said from the pulpit, including myself, that statistically are not true. And so that's what that book's going to be about. But so please buy The Nuns. It's on sale right now, ebook and print copy, soft cover. It's actually 17 bucks on Amazon. It's on sale right now. So uh, get you a copy. You can always find me on social media, uh, at Ryan Burge on Twitter. I tweet out graphs about religion. That's basically all I do is make graphs about religion and tweet them out, um, usually two or three a day. Um, no commentary, just here's a graph, enjoy your life. Um, so that's that's what I do. You can find me at ryanburge.net. You can also email me. My email address is easily findable. Just Google my name and you can find my email address on any, there's several websites where it's on right now, ryanburge at gmail.com. Um, you can find me on my EIU website too. So thanks everybody. I really appreciated it. Thanks so much, Ryan. Uh, I was struck in the beginning of your book uh, as you've kind of framed out what you were going to do, you said you're not going to describe the world as we wish it were or hope it could be, but as it actually is. And that's what we've really sought to do today is to to paint a picture of the challenge that's before us, right? Mm-hmm. And gratefully, we serve a God who is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all we could ever ask, think, hope, or imagine. So allow me, if I may, to close us in prayer today. Let's pray Absolutely. together, friends. Gracious God, we we thank you for this time together. Lord, we confess that the challenges are great, but Lord, we also profess that you are greater. And uh, God, I pray for all of those that have gathered on this uh, Zoom call today, that Lord, you would grant us wisdom and you grant us sensitivity and understanding to to find the, the ways forward, Lord, to be able to lift up your name and encourage those who are struggling with uh, their understanding of of who you are for the nuns. Gracious God, um, may you have your will and have your way in our lives as we seek to honor you. And Lord, may the name of Jesus be lifted high as we seek to glorify you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As I say to my congregation, go in peace to love and serve your neighbors. Amen. Thank you, Ryan. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thank you you very much. Everybody have a great day. Thanks.